know, I'm really happy that Ronan was before me talking about not believing in statistics because we also don't believe in statistics. Uh, today I'm going to talk about research through making. It's a method that we have been developing the last three years and it's about looking closer and about the power of image. Mostly of the time when you talk about cities, we tend to talk about cities in terms of hard data, the statistics. So normally there would be population rate, uh, employment level, uh, how much money we make, how much kids do we have. In the case of Detroit, which is the first project I'm going to talk about today, those statistics were telling us about a shrinking city, about high crime, crime rates, about uh, ha massive house evictions, um, and like the number of wild dogs roaming the streets. Now, this is only part of the story. And I've been an urban planner for more than 10 years. So in a sense, growing up in the growth decade, um, I was used to basing my work on part of these statistics because the developers who gives me a job, they also base their investments on these statistics. But it's only part of the story. And uh, three years ago, I wanted to look closer. So I co-founded the Ping Pong Express. And this is a collaboration that has fundamentally changed the way I work and for, to a large extent, also the way I live. Because we are interested in the stories beneath the statistics, closer to ourselves. And those stories can be uh, networks of the city, they can be social connections, it could be a civic initiative or a weird urban phenomena as graffiti of a city. They all tell us about the story uh, of the city, but in different ways, but they are often hidden, so you have to go and look for them. So that's what we do. Our method is that we go to locations, and until now we've been working in Detroit, uh, Sindostasius, uh, Heerle, Tokyo, most recently Russia. And what we do basically always is to go there and embed ourselves fully in the context. That means that we work, we sleep, not only, not very luxurious always. We gamble, of course, very important. And we always sport in public space. We go to the bar on Saturday and we go to the church on Sunday. And this is to dig into the context that we are working in. We make nothing new. We investigate networks that are there and we try to visualize them. Because we think that although they are often overlooked, they are the motor of any new successful development, and especially in cities that are experiencing a strong transition, as in Detroit. But we want to make them visible, so we make them, we translate them into an image or an installation. And we use the image because it is a powerful medium, and regardless of your background, uh, cultural background, education level, or religious belief, you can tap into that image. And how we do this, I'm going to show you now, <laughs> with the three examples. We're going to start where we started in Detroit. Now, this is downtown Detroit, around the corner from where we lived. I don't know if you know the story about Detroit, but this uh, massacre. Um, but there were some really interesting things going on there. In Detroit, uh, you can't find supermarkets anymore in the downtown area. You have to uh, get into your car and drive uh, three quarters of an hour to the suburbs where you can buy fresh produce. And otherwise, uh, you have to purchase your food at the local liquor store, and that tends to be canned food, uh, uh, liquor. <laughs> so, Pieces in Green is a private organization that uh, uh, sells fresh produce in the downtown area from their truck. And we went with them for a couple of days. This is Marvin, the driver, who knows everybody in the neighborhood. And we noted down everything they sold, where they sold it. This is an old lady who couldn't walk, so he would walk into her and sell her some oranges. And to whom? Now, we can show you this list of the hard data. This is the list of how many pineapples, how many oranges, how many watermelons were sold. But it doesn't tell about the power and potency of what they do. This is the same list, but translated into a still life. It is what was sold uh, during one day in the downtown area. The next project is in Heerle. Heerle is, used to be the mining capital of the Netherlands. And um, 
It used to be, uh, we went to Friheide and that used to be a very modernist progress neighborhood, housing the upper middle class. And now it is a dilapidated neighborhood and there is a, a large group of people on social welfare and uh, drug trafficking. And the municipality doesn't really know what to do with it. When we first came there, we met this park. This was a, so, like a civic initiative but there were no, 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 never anybody there. There was only the smell of dog shit. Because everywhere you can see, there was uh, like excrements. Now this is a, the sign of a social network, but actually the success of the social network is uh, making that nobody is gonna stay there for a long amount of time. So we thought we're gonna map this. So we went into the field for 10 hours, mapping each excrement individually. And this part of being in public space for a longer period of time is also a part of our method because it sparks discussion. So people will come up to us and say, I've been complaining for years about the smell and I will get threats and rotten eggs thrown at my window. Or dog owners will come and stare in disbelief at the sheer amount of dog shit. 2,500 umbrellas replaced that day. Here you see a detail of the dog run. So this is the legal excrement area. And here you see the rest of the park. As you can see, there is no difference in density. So actually what this shows is that it's not enough to call it a park to make it a park. And our installation sparked a new discussion about the use of the park, because you couldn't ignore it. The last project I'm gonna talk about is from Amsterdam West, what we did this year, it's called Supernatural. And it all started with this. It's a container for bread. We found this inside and we went after the story. And it turns out the bread is holy to Muslims. So they can't just throw it out with the waste and the garbage, but they scatter it on the earth to feed the animals. But in a densely Muslim populated area, this turned into a rat problem. Um, but we dug out the bread with the, uh, we talked to the mom first and then it was okay. And uh, we found it uh, to have a strange beauty and we went in to investigate that actually it is owned, it's just disposed as waste together with the other waste. And we thought that was a shame. So we uh, tried to find a better solution. So uh, we went visiting waste removal companies. We talked to uh, universities and uh, we did our own private experiments that was not always successful. But there's a lot of energy in bread. In four loaves of bread, you have a thousand liters of biogas and you can cook for a full hour on those four loaves of bread. So we collected all the bread from the containers over six weeks, and we made an exhibition called Supernatural, where we installed a prototype fermenting machine that turns bread into gas, together with a tapestry of the bread from the neighborhood. We are presently working on a, a full-scale uh, bread fermenter in the Kolekit. One thing I've learned from this is like uh, three years ago, I used to get up, uh, cycle to work, and sit behind the computer for the most of the day. Now, in every, any given week, I will have a conversation with the imam, or I will pump bread and anxiously watch the pH value and talk to the microbiologist. I will do garden work with black panthers or get singing lessons from a Russian opera singer. So I think I can recommend to everybody to look closer. Thank you for your time.